So we have a striped bass pattern for you. And uh, Chris, you guys take it away here. So today we're going to be tying up our take on a, uh, a striper fly that was tied by a good buddy of yours uh, out in the West Coast, San Francisco. Uh, Steve Adachi has created a pattern that's pretty, pretty brutal, epic, super productive. Uh, and we wanted to take one and make it a little bit of a East Coast homage and hat tip to him and also one that we can throw at the striper here. So start off B10 S, you know I like the stinger hook. I like the stinger hook just because it ends up being something that's really, really thin and punchy. So that type of that type of E usually is gonna seal the deal on a hard mouth. And stripers typically like water from 58 to 68 degrees. Um, so when usually when they, the water hits 70 degrees, they don't like it, but that's more on the East Coast and the West Coast might be a little different. Yeah, and then as far as how you're fishing them here in the river, the rivers or lake, you're gonna want something that sinks really well. So we're moving straight to a dumbbell eye. In this case, I have a chartreuse. As we know, if it ain't chartreuse, there ain't no use. Good size here. Yeah, striped bass have large lateral lines, so they feel, um, some, a lot of them feed at night. It's a really famous uh, way to fish for them, especially in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. So something that drops is, is really good. Understood. Yeah, at this point, we're doing it on top of the hook shank too, so it drops this way, and it'll ride hook point up, keep you off the bottom. Uh, after that, we're going to go straight to a piece of flashaboo. And Flashaboo, the reason why we use Flashaboo is from Steve Adachi. He actually developed the Flashaboo, for, not the actual product, but, but using it as the tail. Using it as the tail. And uh, he, it has to be the longest part of the fly to make the, the, the complete tail, I would guess. It makes a lot of sense, you know, and it's something too that doesn't foul a lot. So if you're casting a lot, especially out there, West Coast, like, you guys are catching them in the surf and stuff. I'd mm -hmm. imagine casting at them like crazy would just foul your, your fly all up all the time. So I like this material because it doesn't do that near as bad. And what I've done is I've doubled it up over itself just so it's a little bit thicker than it began. I'll go ahead and trim it off at the back. I'm just going to do this in like a little step trim so it appears really natural. Yeah, and the, the, these fish move a lot, right? Because the... I mean, because they're doing water and some of the food they eat is probably their favorite food is squid. Interesting. Yeah, we've tied these up a little bit last last couple of days. And I think this pattern will kind of do a good job of kind of creating that squid like color set anyways. That's probably why. Yeah, squid are white, but when they're either in trouble or upset, I guess they turn yeah. pink or uh, red. They'll, they'll definitely turn. So they definitely turn. Interesting fact about twid, a squid, they can grow 22 inches in a year. Holy smokes. In one year. Jeez. Yeah, in one year. That's pretty epic. All right, so next we're moving to a rooster cape here. I got white. I like these rooster capes. Um, sometimes when tying this fly, I've noticed, and you can take it on yourself to choose which way you prefer. Um, but I like to sometimes tie it before I put the lead eyes on. I like to do that so I can get a nice flat kind of finish on these feathers. So if it gives me a little jip, that's why. But you can do it either way you like. Yeah, and uh, striped bass, you know, they're very aggressive. They hit hard because um, they're, they're ambush predators, you know. So they, they, sit, they sit in sometimes very shallow water. Like the biggest striped bass you'll catch is probably very close to the shore. That's insane. And rocks. And the, probably the biggest striped bass you might catch is near the Cape Cod Canal. And well, them moving so much too, I guess that's half the reason why they're so epic to catch on a fly rod because they're just tanks. Well, they're very accessible for a fly right. fisherman. Right. No bass. What I'm doing, I'm pulling two off at a time that seem to have about the same shape. Um, when this fly gets wet, this all tapers down really nice, but it's nice if you have feathers that coexist really well some might say that the fly looks better wet oh that's funny yeah so Give me a little background on that well yeah so a buddy of ours uh developed a fly more of a deceiver style out in the san francisco bay area and named kind of like the looks better wet because when it, as it tapers into a bait fish and speaking of bait fish most of the of the not year round but most of the the bait fish 
um, in those areas are sand eels, which are actually quite small. Interesting. But we know stripers are uh, very aggressive, so the bigger the better, I think, especially if you can throw it. Um, but you can catch them in so many different ways. You can catch them on the surf. You can catch them on the flats, actually. You can catch them on paddle boards and then big boats and huge rips. So, Or you can get a bike on the Cape Cod Canal and just bike away and that's fish the shore. That's all. Dude, here... Um, there's some guides out in the Columbia, South Carolina area. Uh, the, there was one in particular that I got to fish with before, and he's got the jet boat, and he's cruising up rapids. Like, honestly, the fishing was epic. It's fun to do, obviously. We, we worked really hard. That might be the hardest working guide I know. Look up the guides in South Carolina. But uh, honestly, riding the boat in general was just as, just as exhilarating. So some players in the, uh, I guess, striped bass fly fishing industry are uh, Jamie Boyle from uh i think he's martha he's martha's vineyard um captain tom's charters who's a person i used to work with on the west coast obviously steve adachi dan blatton and then there's another guy named mike costello who is an oh. epic 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 uh bass he told, fisherman he told me about him. He and then john sherman who is a sims rep oh epic well here in columbia um if you're if you're a striper guy out there don't mean to forget anybody but the guy that i've met and had Great time with his name's Justin. He runs what's called the SC River Guide. Just look him up. But uh, right now we're moving to Bucktail next. The reason we like Bucktail is because it also doesn't foul near as bad. And I'm going to get some of the bushier section of this Bucktail kind of up towards the top here. So I want something that's going to create kind of a fat, wide profile body on this thing because we're going to end up flipping it up and down as far as which sides of the hook shank. And rolling it with our thumbnail, make sure it goes all the way around. We'll start by just getting some clean butts. And originally, I think it was Popovich or Gunnar Bramar. Excuse the motorcycle. I don't know if you guys heard that or not. We're on King Street. It's Saturday night, live in the old yeah, in the old flood tide. And we're doing King flood Shop. time videos. Most, Losers. Most folks are doing something extremely. You know, risque maybe, but we're in here time for for whoever wants to watch. So thanks. Yeah, and then uh, another like fun fact about uh, striped bass is that they can live up to like almost fifty years old. Yeah. And the like, world record for a striped bass, I think, is around eighty pounds. It's an eighty pound fish, and it was around the Elizabeth Islands in Buzzards Bay, just outside of Buzzards Bay. That's an epic fish. Yeah, so they definitely get large, and they live a long time, so I guess I get pretty sensitive when people kill them. Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, I'm a kind of a very sensitive person about a lot of different fish, but uh, striped bass for sure. It's hard, though, because it is a part of the culture on the East Coast. Um, if you are in these areas, you'll see, like, uh, striped bass and copper ahead of, like, a, a doorway or something like that, so. Understood. All right, we're doing this again, just what we did last time. We just got a couple security wraps and then pulled that bucktail against the hook shank, rolled it with our thumbnail so it's tiring to kind of cover the entirety of it. We'll do that one more time here on the belly after we clean up these ends. And then we'll move on to some brush. Some typical lines for striped bass, probably the most common is an intermediate line, which means it sinks one to two inches per second. Mm -hmm. But sinking line, uh, it definitely helps a lot, especially if you're in the surf. Depending on how big the surf is, you can go from intermediate to a sink six, or you can use top water and do a uh, floating line. But I would definitely have a quiver of maybe three lines. It's always good to have options. All I'm doing now is just securing this bucktail in to the point where I can move on to our next material. The next one we've got set up to add to this fly. So far, this is what we're looking at. Next one we've got to add is a uh, a neat little sparkle crafter brush by EP. And uh, you know, some folks like I know that sometimes when you tie these, you can run through an entire brush just to give it that full body. But I like to kind of conserve these. These aren't the cheapest material in the world. Um, so I'll try to kind of space it just as evenly as I can as I go with each wrap around the hook shank. But we'll start by trimming it off at the end. Don't want to use these scissors to do it. But I'll do 
this. Get yourself a bunch of scissors. That's definitely a trick of keeping them alive. And remember, a stripping basket is pretty important, especially if you're fishing the surf. Um, you do cast and cast and cast and cast and cast for these fish. Unlike redfish, where it's very visual or tarpon, it's not the most visual fishing. So you're just you're grinding. Yeah, um, I am not a huge fan of the stripping basket and the way it feels. But like at to be 1,000% honest, every single time I've ever fished, I've always had some type of moment where I think, well, that would have been handy. Like fly line everywhere, it's just inevitable. Um, speaking of everywhere, we got to keep a brush on deck. Uh, a literal brush for the brush. As we brush this stuff across, it's just going to keep us from really getting a nasty, nasty knot as we rotate around. And I think that you can get one of these little teeny brushes. I think I got this from Chewy, the uh, the website you buy dog food, cat food, anything else. Don't feel like you gotta get the most expensive things all the time. The striper don't care. Striper definitely don't care. <laughs> We're gonna wrap that over the eyes and under the hook shank, trying to keep it as tidy as we can. And the same thing, back over the eyes the other way. So you're making basically an X right there over it. And what that'll do is just kind of make sure you're getting it all in front of the eyes as you're coming back forward to finish this guy up. There's many things to remember, but I think the probably the most important is uh, the strip strip pause. So you want to make sure that fly really drops because uh, they tend to hit when it's dead. So you strip strip pause drop and then you'll get it around the next strip. I got a buddy named Roland here locally in Charleston and uh, great guy, old, old Darth. Um, he's doing a lot of fishing, at least in the winter time. Uh, it isn't visual for redfish. So he'll fish around docks or pilings and things like that. And um, he has a, a, a method. He's calling it the, the chop chop. Chop chop. And that chop chop is, uh, you know, essentially the same technique, but. It's going to end up being a little bit easier if you can be, basically, I always compare it to someone that's really bad at keeping time, clapping. Have you ever been to a some type of service event or show and people are trying to clap along? I can see this band or whoever's you know entertaining just get super upset internally because everyone else is ruining your tempo. Well, if you can get like that with your chops, yeah. to where you're not in a completely syncopated rhythm, it looks, you know, the fishiest. Yeah, they're they're definitely interesting fish. Well, all fish are pretty interesting, but striped bass. I think the the coolest thing about them is that they move so much. So I had a guy come up to the vineyard and say, like, "Where's the spot?" I said, "It could be anywhere. I probably a fish has been caught on every part of the island." So it's kind of exciting if you work hard and if you you really grind, you can you can see results. That's awesome. Here, you know, it's interesting. I think. Uh, we didn't catch any striped bass the last time I got to go to Columbia, and I'm excited to go back and try. But the reason being is uh, the water turns over is what the kind of slang is for that. But essentially, the water from the dam, the temperature of, of warm water from the surface and the temperature of cold water at the bottom switches. And when they rotate like that, it changes the entire behavior of all the species you know trout stop biting the smallmouth way less way less aggressive and the striped bass were really hard to find so i'm excited to get back out there and try it so once you've got all that brush up at the top and you've created a nice little head on this fly you're ready to whip finish i mean this thing's already i mean that looks delicious let's go ahead and whip it Yeah, the bigger the better. Um, they do, they, you know, you can catch them, you know, really any size, but I typically like a big fly, especially if the water's dirty, maybe in the river system, system or in the delta in California. But in the clear, clear East Coast, Montauk, or uh, you know, that those Massachusetts waters, um, pretty much anything, pretty much anything works because they can see anything. Sure. At this point, we're just making this fly. Nice and durable at the thread wraps by putting it with our UV cure, our flow, by loom. And then we're going to zap that with the UV light. 
If you have one of those, great. If you don't, you can use all kinds of other stuff. I know uh, Hard as Nails was one of my favorites for a long time. Either way, we're going to make this thing a little bit more durable by doing that because these fish do hit, and when they hit, they're on there, it's insane. So this should survive nice. I think this is ready to be thrown at striped bass. And if you guys have any, any interest in learning more about these fish, there are other methods. We do use two-handed rods sometimes and shooting head systems, so we can get more into that in a different episode. But the whole point of these podcasts or fly time videos is to you kind of teach you about these fish and also teach you to fly at the same time. Yeah, I'm really stoked that we can figure out a way to get to hardcore information and facts, but also show you how easy it is to tie up the right bugs. So thanks for watching. Thank you very much.